Hello everybody, we are going to have a quick chat about pairing and I'm going to give you some information about what um, what actually is going on when we're doing pairing um, so that we can make better choices for ourselves and for our um, students when we um, use pairing, when we choose to use it. So um, pairing is when we have the reinforcer, whether that's the food or the toy, and a target odour um, presented to the dog at the same time. So um, there's lots of ways that we can do that. The main way that we know in scent work or canine nose work is to have the target odour and the food together. So we've just got the tin um, uh, with the target odour in it, birch and east clove or cypress, and then we just put food on top. That's the way that I learned it um, when I was doing my CNWI back in the day. Um, but the um, idea of having those um, uh, the target odor and the reward or the reinforcer together does heart um, hiking whatever that word is does go further back to the days of um, um, detection work um, a few decades ago it was the original sort of way I think where a lot of people um, would put the narcotics or the, um, the drugs or the whatever it is that they wanted to dog teach the dog to go find um, in with the rolled up um, uh, towel or the tug toy of some kind and they would just play with the dog and um, believe and understand that as long as the dog was playing and um, having a good time that the scent or the target odor would be the target I'm a birdo the target odor would be um, uh, also uh, uh, become part of that would be a stimulus would be a smell that the dog would experience and therefore associate with the game so our goal um, is to link the known odor or the known thing so the food or the toy um, uh, of the desired stimulus with the unknown odor so the thing that the dog wants uh, wants to get um, and already understands we want to link that with the thing that it do the smell that it doesn't know about um, and the properties the emotional properties the um, the physiological properties is probably a better way to say it um, uh, links back that that is associated with that um, uh, with the thing that they know gets linked back to the new thing so this is straight straight classical conditioning good old Ivan Pavlov the guy who had dogs and bells um, and taught them to salivate when they heard the bell um, so it's the association that makes the dog want to find the unknown odor um, it has to have meaning it's that meaning that um, makes the dog want to go out and find it um, because it has linked it or it's associated that new smell with um, the the good thing. So, um, in scientific literature, um, when we're trying to associate one thing with another thing, um, it's classical conditioning. So, operant conditioning is when we have trying to link behavior with an outcome or a consequence um, but it's classical conditioning when we click our clicker and give the dog some food blow our whistle um, and um, and um, throw the ball whatever it happens to be um, and good old Pavlov he did a lot of experiments on linking two things together um, and how that you could do it in all different ways and which was the best way the way to present these two stimuli one that um, the dog knows about and one that they don't know about what's the best way um, and best means quickest um, uh, um, association the strongest association the most long-lasting association all of those things we want um, he fiddle farted around with all of those, um, all of the ways to um, put them together um, and um, came up with a whole list of them. Now the one when we're using pairing and having the, um, the two things together so the dog experiences them pretty much at the same time, we're using what he called simultaneous conditioning. And simultaneous conditioning um, is exactly that. In the laboratory, he would um, uh, ring the bell out while the dog was eating, say, in the, in the um, traditional experiments. Um, so um, that's opposed to things like, or uh, um, conditioning programs like um, uh, present, uh, letting the dog hear the bell and then waiting a second and then presenting the food. Um, uh, 
there's lots of other ones um, continually ringing the bell and while the bell is ringing let it ring for a bit um, and after like three seconds then present the food um, present the food and then ring the bell does the dog learn the association there so he did them all around um, and um, uh, as I said that was a big part of um, Pavlov's work um, and what he learned was that simultaneous conditioning can create some association but it's not the best way and if we go back and we sort of like take it right back and think to ourselves well what is learning all about anyway you know we we come in all of these different forms um, uh, and bodies and we're in a situation where we pop out of the egg or the uterus or not the uterus but you know down the canal um, and we are what we are but every single organism on the planet also has the capacity to learn. And learning is very much part of survival. Um, evolution takes us so far, um, but then when we pop out as a boxer dog or as a human being, we um, are now presented with an environment that is going to be changeable. So to some degree, we have to be changeable and our behavior has to be changeable as well to make the most out of the environment and what is as available so think about it the process of learning is all about survival um, and what pavlov found is that the best associations are made in our minds and this is true for us and for rats and for dogs and for fish and for camels and for cats for birds the best associations occur when the thing that is new comes to predict something that is known so the bell happens just before the food the meat for those dogs in Pavlov's um, laboratory and um, and therefore the bell comes to predict that the food is going to happen was going to be delivered um, so I've said it there it seems to be that the best learning about associations one thing and another comes when an animal can use a thing to predict another if we've got this new thing that's followed, so in our case, a target odor, if the target odor is followed by something that the dog loves and it's great, then that odor, the target odor, will come to predict the great thing. And so it very quickly becomes meaningful for the dog. I smell that birch, I can expect this or I can expect that, I can expect the food to be thrown in, or I can expect mum to come on in with the food, or I can expect someone to chuck a ball in my general direction. With simultaneous conditioning, which is what we're doing when we're pairing, we've got the food on the odor at the same time. Um, we're in a situation where we can, because they're presented together, there isn't any predictive value in the new stimuli so the birch smell doesn't particularly mean that the food is going to come we don't know the dog might we don't know how odor travels through the air and and we never know when we're pairing and when we've got the odor and the food together which odor gets to the dog's nose before um be, uh, first it might be that the food gets there first it might be that the birch smell that they don't know gets there first but when we've got a situation where something new and something known happen together because we don't it, the new thing isn't giving us any valuable information oftentimes we completely ignore it and that process is called blocking so the known thing blocks we don't have to pay attention to the new thing no value to us so um, so we don't pay attention you might have heard of learned irrelevance um, and other terms that and there's all variations on a theme but basically it is exactly that that mm, I don't have to need to learn about that because I've got all the information I already need in the smell of the food in our case and that was is what I need to follow to get to the food just the fact that there's another smell there um, may or may not 
even be recognized by the dog. And in some situations now in research, Pavlov didn't have this sort of technology in his lab all those years ago, back in the 1940s and the 1930s and 1940s, not really that long ago. But nowadays technology has come on so much that we can actually look into the brain. Here comes my birds coming home and the dogs are about to bark. Um, uh, he heads on over to the neighbours and spends the day in some nice trees there. He can't fly, someone um, cut his wing off. Anyway, um, just if you hear barking, that's what it will be. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, um, we can look into the brain when we're um, now um, in different ways um, and we can see when bits light up and um, now when we can do that we can actually see that when these two things are presented together one I know and one that is meaningless to me and they're presented together we can see that the little bit of the brain that is all about learning these associations doesn't link up so really cool information so if we've got two things again that happen together and this is another thing that can happen and one is more obvious than the other that's called overshadowing so the same thing ends up happening that the novel odor the odor that we want to be um, so strong and meaningful in the dog can when we're pairing actually become or get be, become meaningless to the dogs because as I said they're experiencing it but they're not getting any value from it there's no extra meaning so you can ignore it Ooh, right can learn to ignore it so it's really impossible when we think well hang on Peter it, it works and we are going to talk about that don't worry but when we think about that okay there's good Rigor, rigorous and that means it's pretty solid and it's been repeated over and over again scientific information that when two things are presented together learning about the the novel stimuli or the new smell <laughs> doesn't um doesn't there's just a cricket now right there coming up and it just made a noise and so now the dogs are hunting it Ugh. um so um it's impossible to say what the dog is actually learning if we're just talking about pairing. It's not that simultaneous conditioning definitely doesn't work ever and, and nothing is learned. And because we're working with odor and we've got the odor, the novel stimulus, the birch out with the food and we don't know how the um, scent molecules are traveling through the air, if we put them out together at the same time and open up and just let the dogs in, we can never be sure that they're hitting the odour of birch before they hit the odour of food. So we can't tell that they're experiencing the novel odour before they experience the known odour. And that's what the science tells us needs to happen. New thing before known thing for the best learning to occur. So science can tell us that probably what's happening is that the odor of the food acts as a prompt to lure the dog in to come to source and every single one of you to some degree i know have used a food lure to put a dog's head up so his bum goes down um lure them into a lie down lure them through the weave poles there's heaps of heaps of um ways that we can use luring and once the behavior is trained we don't use the food in the hand anymore as the lure that food or the toy becomes the reinforcer um so in the presence of a paired hide we can say pretty much that, okay, the meaning of the birch is absolutely nil. They're, they're dig, oh my God, I wanna show you this now. Bloody hell. This is what's going on, this is why I'm moving. <laughs> keeping it real, keeping it real. So, um, the odor of the food that's paired is going to draw the dog in, right? It acts as a prompt. Um, and to look so the best way to think about it in a way that we understand is that it's a lure the meaning of the target odor so that's the birch or whatever a brown the meaning of the target odor comes when the dog experiences source 
and associates not the food that is paired there on top of the odour, but it starts to learn the meaning of the odour, the birch, when we come in and deliver the food or throw the toy because it's that thing that happens just after I smell that birch that is going to be start to create the strong association that we want and that we need when we're talking about detection or scent work. We know that if we've got those two things together, oh, well, let's just do it. Okay, well, that's fine. Obviously, there's a level of the fact that it works because thousands of dogs, thousands of trainers use pairing out there for their nose work um, sessions all the time. But we do know, science says, well, doing that means that the odour of the food in the, that is paired with the hide can block the target odour and that might make it harder long term for the dog to have a strong association. The learning happens when the good thing, once the dog has smelt the odour, the birch, um, gets linked with that good thing. But we know pairing works. Many of us do it all over. Um, I use it sometimes and some people swear by it. But let's just look at it in the role that it's in. And there's two things we have to think about. We don't just want an emotional association. We don't just want a physical, physiological response. If we use pairing uh, of food and the target odor, our birch, then, um, and we do that over and over and over again, there might be enough times where the birch odor um, is, perceived by the dog before he eats the food, that we might get a physiological response like Pavlov got, salivation. But that's not an alert response. What we want is the dog to do something, even just a little bit of something when it's learning that odor. And it's that little bit of behavior that we um, grab hold of and start to strengthen through training that becomes our alert behavior. So I've said there, we need the odor to evoke a behavior that we can strengthen through training. That's our alert behavior. Now, if we don't move in and give the dog more food after they've found that paired hide, or if we don't throw a ball after they've found that paired hide or whatever it is, that happens that that your dog wants to happen that is the good thing that you use for the reward for your dog then not only is the is the meaning of the odor going to be questionable but we're not going to get that look back response even just a flick that we can then strengthen as our alert behavior and I'm specifically talking the canine nose work methodology here right where we've got a paired hide out um, we get told as the dog comes in and starts to eat that food, you rush in and bang, put that food down. Um, it's that occurrence that's creating the real strength and the real meaning of the um, uh, value of the, of the birch. Um, and not only is it creating meaning, it's cr giving the dog, we come in and so now the dog goes, oh, when I smell that smell, I predict that mum's going to rush in and give me some food. And that's where the strong learning is going to um, really occur. Um, I've just said the same thing a different way. The dog looks to be ha to the handler after he's eaten the paired of uh, the food on the on the birch when we're pairing, because he predicts that that's going to happen. That owner's going to come in and give some more food because that's what's happened in the past. This equals that. This means that that's going to happen. It's all about prediction. You can shut up now, Spaz. So, all learning involves more than just performing a behavior. Um, it involves first the environment telling us um, or giving us a, um, a, some advice on which way to behave, to get the best out of that environment. If, we're, if we go out to a fancy restaurant and we know it's a fancy restaurant, we can tell because the, there's more knives than we've ever seen before and we don't know which fork to use and, and the, the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the um, uh, tablecloth is silk um, and there's violins playing. That's kind of all um, information from the environment that we're not at Macca's, that we're at a fancy restaurant. So we behave as if we're at a fancy restaurant. If we're at my place, um, even if I might find myself a silk tablecloth, you're probably going to be more comfortable to burp and fart 
if we've got that kind of relationship, right? But even if you come to go to the fancy restaurant with me, you're probably not going to burp and fart there because it's the environment is telling you behave this certain way. Don't embarrass Peter. Be careful Peter doesn't embarrass you. It's probably more the same. So the environment is always telling us how to behave. Then there's the behavior. And then is the consequence that you all know and understand the information from the environment that says do more of that, what we call the reinforcement. And of course, there's punishment and all the others too. Um, so whenever you're thinking about a behavior, and this isn't just your alert behavior or how to do something in scent work, think of not just the behavior and the consequence. You want to deliver your food or you want to deliver your toy um, uh, at source or not at source. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, but think about the environment that it's happening in as well. And I want you to think about one of the, the things that we um, say about the A part of what is called a three, um, three term contingency. That, and all you need to remember is there's always three parts to learning a behavior. The environment, and the information from the environment, and part of that is a cue, or when you're trying to teach a cue. That's why we say if you're, you want your dog to learn sit just on the verbal cue, don't say the word as you do the hand signal, say the word sit and then give the hand signal. So the word, that silly sound, predicts that hand movement. I understand that hand movement because that's how I was lured into a sit. Hey presto, you've got a dog that puts his bum on the ground when you say sit. Um, so the cue, our odour um, of the paired hide, that gives the dog the information because following food is pretty much something that no dogs have to learn. But in canine nose work methodology, we use food searches uh, in boxes to build up confidence, blah, 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 hunting skill, blah, 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 blah. Um, but that is the cue that follows the odor of, uh, gives the behavior of following the odor um, of the food. Um, and the handler brings in more food. And if we're lucky somewhere along the way there, there will be some sort of recognition or some kind of experience of the birch odor. So B and C, the behavior and the consequence is where learning about your behavior, following that, that cue and doing it again in the presence of the cue, following it, following it, um, uh, is what happens when we have that behavior and that consequence linked together. Um, there you go. So pairing on its own, just understand that pairing on its own, if you never run in and give the bit of food or you never run in and give the toy or throw the toy or whatever it happens to be um, uh, that you use, you're going to have minimal, if any, learning about what the birch um, means to your dog or whatever odor you use. So I'm just gonna give you some tips because I do sometimes use pairing, um, but I know how to use it in a way or set my environment up in a way that I can use what the science tells me so that I can give the dog the best possible chance of a good learning experience. So. Over lots of repetitions, we know, if you don't know anything about this, we know over lots of repetitions, the dog will soon learn to, um, to go and find this smell um, and look back at you expecting that you're going to deliver some food. That's if you use pairing and then after the dog eats the food, you come in with more food, okay? That will, that will definitely work, but it's not because the pairing, the food on the odor, is being linked. It's because the food you deliver is being linked with that smell. And here's some things to think about. Okay, so you can set up the target odor first. If you're doing a class um, and you want to, um, you're up to introducing odor and you're going to use pairing, if you have a big hall, um, and that's where you do your box work and stuff. If you've got just a small room off um, a kitchen or something, my foot's gone to sleep, um, or a small um, room where you store things, if you put your birch hide in there and close the door before class, they do some class, and then halfway through, so the odor's been there half an hour and been allowed to permeate out, 
and then just before the dog runs you go and put the little bit of food in there hang on a minute sparrow stop it bloody chihuahuas um then what you're going to do is you're going or what we expect to happen is that the because the birch odor has been in there longer you're going to have much more birch odor in that small room so as soon as you open the door the dog goes whoa weird smell hang on i smell food bang so we've got novel odor birch before he gets the food that smells the food that is um, being used to pair does that make sense you're still going to run in and give the food but you just give the dog the chance to experience the novel odor before he experiences the known odor because we know that that's where strong learning happens you can put the food under the tin okay so you could if you don't have a small room you could put your odor out and you could put um, and you could put um, some uh, food just under the tin and that reduces the amount that that odor, food, odor from the food can seep out. So again, we're expecting that because we know the basics of scent theory, the molecules from the birch odor are going to travel further. Thus, they're going to hit the dog um, before the, he hits the odor of food. And hey presto, we've got novel odor equals odor I know. Birch odor equals food odor. And again, you're still going to run in to make sure that's nice and strong and feed at source. Um, you can use very bl bland or dried food um, and save the, you bet your food, the really smelly, gorgeous food for the one that gets delivered. So a food that is dry um, and less palatable is generally not going to be as volat volatile. Um, is that the right word? It's not going to be as active a spreader. I think that's the right word, but it's getting late in the day. Uh, you know what I mean. Um, so um, that's a way that we can try and help the odor of the birch get to the dog's senses before it gets to, um, uh, before the dog experiences the food odor. Again, making that novel odor happen just before the known odor so we can get good learning. Um, I've said that so I put those two together um, and the other thing that you can do is pair do your pairing with lots of residual food or smells around so if you've got lots of food smells everywhere um, and the dogs going through and suddenly it goes oh hang on that's a very weird new smell but I do smell food there it just makes the birch smell the odor of the birch so much more of a contrast or novel stimulus which is also valuable for us that it just might help get over that um, hump of um, of um, the the weaknesses that we have when we use simultaneous conditioning okay so I hope that helps just a little bit um, and um, um, the next one we're going to do of this is we're going to talk alert behavior because we wanted to talk about that what's the difference between a trained alert and what we call an untrained alert as far as I'm concerned and my con as far as I'm concerned comes from the science okay so it's um, it just gives us a good basis on which to um, uh, um, um, develop our training strategies